Perfect, perfect. What a blessing. There's a great, great message in that song. Amen. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. You know, in the Bible, when, you, when you're reading through your Bible, David prayed, uh, Noah prayed, Abraham prayed, Paul prayed, Peter prayed, John prayed. Everybody's praying, amen? Even our Lord is praying. And the early church met together, and the early church prayed. And there was great power because of that prayer. Uh, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Uh, sometimes prayer is a very difficult thing to do because it's a spiritual work and there's spiritual opposition to it. But it's very, very powerful. We'll begin reading in verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. And our text will be verse 8. <clears throat> I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Father, thank you for the word. Thank you for the songs that have prepared us for this, how you have led, how you have guided. And I pray that you would continue in the service today to speak to us and to draw us and to lead us. God, thank you for the privilege we have of prayer. And as we pray right now, we pray believing that you're going to bless today. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a great, great, great subject. And I want to look today at what prayer contains and that what true prayer omits. And so we will look at that as we go through the scriptures. Prayer is powerful because it puts us in touch with God. That's who we're praying to, amen? And he's, he's all-powerful and he's almighty. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You have our revival verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And then there's a promise given to that. We come to the book of Malachi. These are just, they're all through the scriptures. Chapter 3 and verse 10, God says, prove me now herewith. If I will not pour out a blessing that you might not be able to receive. And so God's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we, what's that next word? Above all that we ask, that's the word. Above all that we ask or think. On exceeding abundantly above all. What a way to describe prayer, amen? And uh, in James chapter 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So prayer does accomplish something, amen? It's the power of God at work. <clears throat> it's a spiritual work. And so David, when he got right with God, he said, renew a right spirit within me. And so he's praying because God desires truth in the inward parts. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25 if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we sang just a minute ago in the Spirit. Amen. We pray in the Spirit. You have Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always in the Spirit. It's a spiritual work. It's not a vain repetition. It's not how many words we use. We might use a few words like, help, Lord. <laughs> That's a good prayer. Uh, I use that one a lot, help, Lord, especially if my wife is driving. Amen? <laughs> no, more so when I'm driving, right? In Jude, verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 
Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual work. To our text now, three things are mentioned here. Uh, holy hands. So when we pray, we're to have holy hands. That's speaking of our right, righteous living, our holiness. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, the psalmist said, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's an amazing verse. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear thee. 1 Peter 3, 7. I think it's wonderful to have a relationship with your mate. And this is speaking to men, but it says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Again, it's speaking about holiness. It's speaking about uh, the right spirit. We have 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So it's not flowery words. It's the heart that prays and cries out to God. And God wants us to do that. And God wants to answer our prayers. Amen. So it is a spiritual, spiritual work. Now, it talks about holy hands. And then it talks about without wrath. We have Matthew 5, 44. <clears throat> but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Have you ever done that? <laughs> it's a difficult thing to do. But it's something that God says, I want you to do that. And you can do that in the spirit. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. In Colossians 3, 8, we're to put off anger, wrath, malice, and evil communication. And there's, a, there's how that progresses. Anger, everybody gets angry. Amen? Okay, everybody gets angry at something. We all get angry at something. But then it says, it says after the anger, it says wrath. That's an outpouring of that anger. And once that starts to come out, then it goes to malice. That's ill will towards the person that you're angry at. And then it comes to evil communications. That's where, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But you see it progressing, amen? And so God wants us to take care of it at the beginning, put it off. Uh, and we'll see a little bit about that later. And then it says, without doubting, James 1, 6, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. We are to believe that when God says he will do something, he will do it. So we, in faith, believe that, and we, we, we give that to the Lord because he is able. Elijah prayed, and fire fell down from heaven. That's a pretty big prayer. Amen? And, uh, I mean, everybody saw it. It, did, it accomplished a lot for the nation of Israel and everybody who experienced that. But then you have Paul, one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. He prayed three times for God to take this thorn in the flesh away. And God said, no, Paul, I'm not going to take that away, but my grace is sufficient for you. And so Paul said, okay, therefore I'll rejoice in this and I'll, I'll receive this because I believe God that's in the best interest of his cause. Amen. Sometimes, as the song said, sometimes we look back and we see how God used something, even some trial in our life. But at the time, we don't see that. Amen. But God is providential and his grace is sufficient hebrews chapter 11 you don't have to turn there but it's the great hall of faith and it talks about by faith abraham by faith moses by faith um it, it says let me get something here by faith they passed through the red sea by faith the walls of jericho fell down by faith rahab the harlot perished not and it goes on and on and on it gives all these examples what a blessing amen that's what I want when I pray. I want all victory. I want just, boy, look at this great answer to prayer. But then it comes down to verse 35. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, and it goes on and on and on. There are some prayers that are answered, and it's with a great victory. 
and there are some prayers that are answered and it's, it's with a personal victory in here, but not out here. And God can give that victory too because he can give us peace in our heart. Jesus prayed when he's going to the cross. He said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup. Let this cup pass from me. And obviously we know the answer to that, but it said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. That's what he said. If it's possible, take this cup. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as I will be done. Remember when Jesus used that model prayer in Matthew chapter 6? Uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and it goes on. And it says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. Jesus came to fulfill the will of God. That's why he came. He came to die on a cross. So not my will, but thy will be done. This is an important part of prayer. Because then we don't get discouraged in our prayer. We just pray for the will of God to be done. Yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. And that's what we sing. And it's a great chorus, but it's a prayer too. Not my will, but thy will be done. Because that's where the prophet is for God. Amen? And God can, of course, give us a good spirit as we do that. So we will spend our time this morning looking at true prayer. They say when they're teaching somebody to spot counterfeit money, they teach them what real money looks like. Then you can spot any counterfeit anywhere. But uh, we'll look at this. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean going down 94 with your head bowed and your eyes closed, you know. Well, I have to pray with my eyes closed or I'll be distracted. Sometimes it's good to be distracted if you're in the car, amen? That it, what it means is to keep on praying. doesn't mean to pray 24 hours a day because that would be impossible. Pray without ceasing. This is a spirit of prayer. I'm quoting. Praying in the Spirit is prayer with divine help. It's trusting in faith and relying on God to hear and understand our requests and our needs. It is communion with God. And so we're speaking to God about a need. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 9, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son and without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. We just prayed today for several people that need prayer. There's many more than that. And as you, you know that, and uh, God brings their face or their name to your mind, pray for them. And that's what Paul is saying here. Pray without ceasing. You have 2 Timothy 1.3. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing... I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. So God is telling Timothy, I'm praying for you all the time. I know the work that you're doing. I know the opposition that you're facing. And I'm praying that God will help you do that. And you read through First and Second Timothy and you see the instruction that he's giving there. Acts chapter 12 and verse 5. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church for him. So the church is praying for Peter without ceasing. Again, it doesn't mean they didn't sleep or, or do something else, but they prayed for Peter. And the prison doors opened up. Amen? It's the first automatic door that was ever built. But uh, the prison door opened up, and out he came. He went free. Uh, we have 1 Samuel 12, 23. Samuel the prophet said, Moreover, it's for me. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. It would be a sin not to pray. So God tells us to pray all the time, amen? It's a spirit of prayer. And so we do that. We, we know people to pray for, we know things to pray for, and we constantly pray for those things. In Isaiah chapter, or I'm sorry, Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So that's what God is saying. Pray that God would provide more laborers for the harvest. Remember John chapter 4 and Jesus, the, the woman at the well, and, and she came to know the Lord, and she went back into the town, and all of these people, all the men of the city are coming out to see what she was talking about. And the disciples are there, and Jesus said, 
Look on the fields that are white unto harvest. Unto harvest. There they are. And that was all of these people coming out of that city. And here's a lady that got saved, and because of her salvation, other people got saved. Now there will be plenty of laborers, right, to minister that harvest. Um, there's all kinds of people out there that need to be saved. They're everywhere. Amen? Well, people just don't get saved anymore. People get saved. And you can say, well, these are the gleaning times. It doesn't matter. People still get saved. You know, well, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, and nobody wants to hear it. Somebody does. And maybe they hear it and they don't get saved right away, but it's the seed that is planted. And so we do that because God says, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. Listen very closely. This is Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said they, said I, send them, right? That's what he said. He said, then said I, here are they, send them. That's not what he said, was it? He said, here am I, send me. Amen? So the Lord says, I need somebody to go for me. And here's Isaiah, and he said, I'll go. Amen? What a privilege. Here's the eunuch, here's Philip. And the eunuch is going back from Jerusalem. And here's Philip in this great revival in Samaria. And God says, go to the desert. Okay, what do you want me to go to the desert for? You'll know when you get to the desert. And so he got there. And here's the eunuch. He's reading the scroll. He's reading Isaiah. And he doesn't know who he's talking about. And he tells him about Jesus. And he gets saved. Amen? Here am I. Send me. There's so many illustrations of that in, in the Bible. Haggai 2.19. Is the seed yet in the barn? Remember, there's Mark 13, Mark, uh, Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. The seed is the word of God and the seed and the sower. And so the seed is the word and some falls on hard ground, stony ground, way, wayside. But some falls on good ground. Amen? Is the seed yet in the barn? We got the seed. All we need to do is scatter it. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him. Have you ever experienced that, where you've been with somebody, you've worked with them for a long time, you've prayed for them, and you were ministering to them, and you were weeping with them? I've told the illustration about Glenn in our church when we were first starting in Sturgis, and it took almost four hours with him, and we sat there going through scripture after scripture. We both, when we got to the end, we're both crying, and he said, Pastor, he said, I want to believe Jesus is God. I just can't believe it. I just can't believe it. I don't understand it. I cannot believe it. And we're both crying. He says, I want to be saved. I want my sins forgiven. I, I want a home in heaven, but I just can't believe that. And I said, well, Glenn, you, God's going to have to show you that. And remember, I said he came the next Sunday to church, halfway through the service. His perplexed look went, like the big smile. And at the end of the service, remember that day? He comes forward and he gets saved. He went on to be a pastor. Amen? And maybe it was that, I'm sure it was that time. There was a fella, a, a lady in our church that was very faithful, and her husband would drop her off every, every week. And he was a good man. He just didn't have anything to do with church. And uh, I, I tried to get close to him, and I would say hi, and then he would be right off. You know, I didn't want to manipulate him or, or burden him. But I remember when his wife was in the, in the hospital a number of times that I sat in the waiting room with him. And we would talk, and we just became friends. And I remember one time we were talking that we both had tears in our eyes. And uh, then ultimately his wife passed. I'm not mentioning any names, but... And then he was in the hospital. His health went, went down. I went up to see him in the hospital, and as I'm going up to go into the room, all the lights are flashing. Uh, 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 there's all this noise going on. A number of doctors were going into his room. A number of nurses were going into his room. And I thought, am I too late? Am I too late? And boy, my heart was, was breaking. And... Pretty soon the doctors came out. I spoke with one and they said, well, this is what happened, but he's okay now. 
I went in and I asked him, and I said, you know, it's time to accept the Lord. And he said, I want to do that. And right there in that hospital room, with tears in his eyes and mine, he trusted the Lord as his Savior. I mean, we, we're all able to do that. Amen? The seed is the Word of God. It's, it's not us. It's the power of the Spirit and that Word that opens the heart. Amen? All we have to do is go. Remember, think of me. Think with me about the time you won your first soul. Think of that. Think of that person that you personally won to the Lord. Think of the person that you personally brought to church and they heard the gospel and they got saved. We're all sowing seed, amen? But God says that we can bear precious fruit. He that wins his souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins his souls is wise. God wants us to do that. That is what God wants. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so he asks us to pray about that, to be involved in somebody's life, but to pray that other people would be involved in somebody's life. But here's the point I want to get to in the message. Prayer, true prayer, is receiving instruction, guidance, counsel from Almighty God. Think of that. Lord, I don't know what to do. I'm like a little child. I don't know how to go out and I, I don't know how to come in. Please give me wisdom. Got it. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth the men, all men liberally and upbraideth not. He that asketh, he will give that wisdom to. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, the Counselor. That's one of the titles for God. That's his attribute. Paul, Lord, Acts chapter 9, he's been a persecutor of the church, and all of a sudden he meets the Lord on the road to Damascus, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus said, I'm, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And then he said, What wilt thou have me to do? Boy, that's a good thing to ask God. Amen? It's not a good thing to ask other people, but ask God. What wilt thou have me to do? And God said and gave him instruction, and Paul followed those instructions all the rest of his life. Amen? You have David. David is coming back with his men, and they see that their city is destroyed and their loved ones have been taken captive. And David says to God, Shall I pursue? And God says, pursue. Good person to ask. Amen? What should I do in this circumstance? Here's Peter, and uh, Peter's looking at somebody else, and he's trying to judge them and wonder what they're going to do. And so Peter says to the Lord, what shall this man do, Lord? Maybe he didn't like the answer, but the Lord said, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. It's not your business what that person is going to do. It's your business, what you're going to do. Amen? I mean, and you can go on and on and on. The Bible is filled with questions and answers. God, what should I do? God, guide me in this area. Direct me in this area. And God will. That's a part of prayer. It's that communion with God, that counsel with God. Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. And in multitude of counselors, there is safety. How do you know it's wise counsel? It's according to the word of God. You ever been to a counselor? counselor? Oh, no, you can't. You can't go to counselors. And if you've been to a counselor, you can't admit it because then everybody thinks you're probably crazy because you're going to a counselor. Well, this just said, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Amen. Well, yeah, that means Jeremiah and Isaiah and Daniel. And, well, that's a lot of counselors, but that's counsel from God too, amen? But what about somebody who knows the Lord, somebody who's praying for you, somebody who can maybe open a door or open an insight for you to help you? So going to a counselor is a blessing, but you can't go to the world. What's the verse I'm thinking of, Richard? Yeah, you do. You know it. Um, beware, lest any deceive you through philosophy and 
the vain deceits after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. I know I missed a couple words in there. But don't be ruined by philosophy. It depends because there are evil counselors. You might get the counsel you want to hear, but it might not be the right counsel. But it says, for by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. Proverbs eleven fourteen, Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors there is safety. It says the same thing. Mark 15, 43, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God. 1 Chronicles 27, 32. Also, Jonathan, David's uncle, was a counselor, a wise man. You have all of these statements in the Bible because in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Amen? And so you can get all of the iron sharpeneth iron. It's a good thing to hear. You have Luke 23, 50. And behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and just. Proverbs 20, 18. The reason I'm using so many verses is it gives credibility to the message. It gives, it gives an authority to the truth that we're speaking because this is God's word. So, yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. This is what God would have us to do. Present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Guide me, Lord. Lead me, and I'll be profitable for you. You have Proverbs, uh, let's see, 20 and verse 18. Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice to make war. Proverbs 21, 30. There is no wisdom, nor understanding, nor counsel against the Lord. Proverbs 19, 21, almost done. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Proverbs 8, 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Lord, I'm like a little child. I don't know how to go out and come in. I don't know what to do in this circumstance. Please give me wisdom. He says he will. Amen. James chapter 3, the wisdom that's from above, and you know it by heart probably, the wisdom that's from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, without partiality, without hypocrisy. It's sown in peace of them that make peace. The wisdom that's from beneath is earthly, sensual, devilish. There's a worldly wisdom and there's a spiritual wisdom. The spiritual wisdom is a battle. You have to get it from God. Get direction from God. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So here's, here's the opportunity of sin. But the word, the word which thou hast spoken has kept me from the paths of the destroyer. We know the word and so we're led, we're, we're guided by Almighty God. That's prayer. Isn't that a blessing? It's communion with God. It's compassion for others and it's counsel from the Lord. We're talking to God. I don't know if you've ever been talking to somebody and you go, boy, what, where is that coming from? You know what I mean? You say, yeah, I was talking to you yesterday and I, that's what I was thinking. But I mean, you just, you, you think, boy, I, I've never heard of that perception of this before and it, you know, it's not biblical, but you wonder. But see, God will give you an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say. That's what he said to all those churches in Revelation. I'll give you an ear to hear what the Spirit has to say. So we take this wonderful, wonderful book, but because it's a spiritual book and our spirit is right, his spirit speaks with our spirit, that we're the children of God, and then we hear what God wants us to do. Amen? Not just what we want to do. Prayer is... Asking, it's receiving, but it's not always things, and it's not always circumstances. It's much greater than that. It's something God does for us here. Can we love God, have peace with God, enjoy God, though he doesn't change circumstances, though our circumstances get more difficult? Can we still love and obey him and enjoy him? God says yes. And that's the purpose of that communion with God. Because at his right hand, or at his throne, or in his presence, there is fullness 
of joy. Such a blessing. The filling of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, etc., etc. Uh, James 1, 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Self-deception is a terrible thing. Colossians 2, 3. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is our Lord and Savior. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So where should I go but to the Lord? Whom have I in heaven but thee? That's where we want the voice to come from. That's where we want the counsel to come from. Because <clears throat> that's wisdom incarnate. Proverbs 20 and verse 5. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man, man of understanding will draw it out. There's a well that has spiritual water. Remember the woman at the well? All she could think of is earthly water. She didn't understand that water that she could drink of and never thirst again. She didn't get it. But when she got it, come see a man told me all things whatsoever I did is not this the Christ. When she got it. Amen. And prayer is important to people that get it because they know they're going to get a drink of cool water, amen, that is going to refresh their soul. Who was it that wrote the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer? Was it Fanny Crosby that wrote that? Sweet Hour of Prayer. An hour? Praying for an hour? I think it was Martin Luther said he prayed for four hours every morning. I don't pray for four hours every morning. But he prayed for four hours every morning, and they said, how come you pray for four hours every morning? He said, well, that's a regular day. If it's a difficult day, I pray for five hours. <laughs> because he knew, he knew he needed God's help, amen? And we need God's help in here. Sometimes our circumstances are great, but this is where we need help, amen? And God can give that help. Come to the well. Come to the Lord. Draw an eye to the Lord. He'll draw an eye to you. Um, there's another verse I'm thinking of, Richard. What's that verse? You missed that one too. Okay. Richard's my right-hand man. I'm telling you, he's a blessing. But uh, come now. No, that's not it. Um, Come unto me. No, that's not it either. Yeah, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Isn't that a good verse? And it's the Bible. Amen. Prayer. It's really powerful. Amen. It's really, really powerful in our hearts and as a church to pray for all of these needs, to pray for souls to be saved, to pray for God to open a door where you can meet somebody that is not saved and you can give them the word of God and they can come to know Jesus as their savior. Just remember back to the souls you've won. Let's bow our heads. Our Father, we're so grateful for the wisdom of your word, for the wisdom of the spirit of God that's available for everybody here, everybody who hears this. And how we need it, Lord, how we need wisdom and knowledge. Lord, bless the word today and give us opportunity to spread the seed, scatter the seed of your word that others might be saved. And Lord, I pray that our communion, our time with you would be sweet. And thank you for that. And bless the message now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.